My name is Eddie Abel. Uh, I coach the Midwest Thunderbirds youth, so U15, U17, U19s uh, on the boys' side. Uh, I'm also the interim head coach at IU, and God willing, I will not be the head coach much longer. This is about forward positional knowledge. Uh, for those of you who heard my amazing talk on game management last night, uh, forward positional knowledge is a very ambiguous term. And when they asked me to talk about it, uh, I kind of decided that I wanted to tailor this around open forward play, so forward play in the loose. Um, and the reason I wanted to do that is, and we'll get to this in a minute, but a lot of the stuff we can talk about with defense and forwards is kind of already settled in terms of best practice. Uh, how many of you in here with your forwards on defense? There's a ruck, right? You got the one, the two, the three. First guy's got the scrum half. Second guy's got the first carrier, right? First set of hands. Everybody runs something similar to that, Man, right? I, there's not much I can do to enlighten you. Um, I believe Snacks gave an excellent kind of presentation last night if you need more stuff on defensive play. So, I want to kind of talk about how we use forwards in attack. And I don't want to limit it, um, as we'll get to in a minute, in terms of like, your prop should always do this. Because in the modern game, all your forwards should be able to do everything, right? Now, they may not do it as well as backs, but they should be able to get to all of it. And so, what I want to talk about is kind of some things I see. Um, and, you know, the reason I have that little parenthetical up there, uh, in my humble opinion, is because. Unlike defense, I think with attack, there's a lot of subjectivity in terms of what is the best thing to do, right? What's this look like? Uh, it's going to be based on your personnel. It's going to be based on your skill level. Um, we can have a legitimate debate about what these guys should be doing in the loose field and what we need forwards to do. Um, and you might see this presentation, and at the end of it, be like, this guy's an idiot. Like, oh, why they even pay for his hotel room? Uh, and that's fine. Uh, because I do think there are legitimate differences in how we can agree on the, the most effective way to deploy your forwards throughout the field. Uh, but this is kind of what I have assembled, and even if you only take one or two things away from this, uh, I, I think it's going to be good. I always say, oh. So, kind of touching on what we already touched on, um, a stat I like to throw out there. Uh, there have been nine World Cup finals for rugby, that's 18 teams. Those 18 teams in 80 minutes of play, you know, in theory, the two best teams in the world, I scored 17 total tries. Right? Five of those came in one game. Uh, so, why, you know, we have the best teams in the world, right? You know, New Zealand's playing in the World Cup final. Uh, anybody who's in DC a few months ago in the Eagles jersey can tell you, New Zealand knows how to score tries, right? So, why can't they score in a final? Well, if we're being honest, I don't want to say defense is easier than attack, but when I say easier, there are less barriers. Right? If you can make one-on-one -on -one tackles and you can get in the right spot, that's defense. Right? And yeah, you can do things like, oh, we pull our 10, we slide across, and we do all these other things. Yeah, there's like little gimmicks. But for the most part, defense comes down to, are you standing in the right place? Do you make your one-on-one -on -one tackles? Attack has variables that defense doesn't, and that makes Defense, in theory, easier than attack, right? You could run the most brilliant, who's ever done this? You put in a play, or you put in a move or something, and it lines up perfectly, and there's this giant gap, and the guy's getting ready to run through it, and it just knocks the ball off. Right? <laughs> and you're just sitting here like, right? Sorry, I guess. Uh, it's happened to all of us, right? And you don't want to yell at the kid, like, everybody knocks the ball off, right? But those variables don't necessarily exist in defense, there's just not as many of them. And so, in theory, a well done good defense, the majority of the time, is going to be a well done attack. Like, it's just facts, right? There are other things to help too, right? Using the sidelines and defenders. The defense has all kinds of advantages. And so, you need to figure out ways to employ your attack to overcome those just inherent disadvantages that all those variables create. Now, I should warn you, kind of a different kind of cat. Uh, I like to take rugby stuff from other places. Um, I actually even coached speech and debate for two years, even though I know nothing about speech and debate, just to kind of see what it's like to coach other things and get that experience. Um, 
if nobody's ever read it, there's a book called Rage by a guy named David Epstein. He used to be a sports writer. Um, it's an excellent book. I'm actually halfway through rereading it a second time. And it's a bit of a sociology thing. It kind of talks about, well, you're better off being a generalist and not specializing until later and all that. But the key takeaway for me, for rugby stuff with attack, is he talks about domains. And there are essentially two kinds of domains. Um, you have what's called a wicked domain, or sorry, let's start with simple domain. A simple domain is you're going to have the same set of problems every single time. Golf is a sport with a simple domain. You could be playing on a course in Wisconsin or California or Brazil or Kazakhstan. It doesn't matter. If you're 90 yards out, you're pulling the same club from the back pretty much every time. The mechanics of your swing are always going to be the same. So you look at somebody like Tiger Woods who started playing golf when he's four, it makes sense that he got really, really good because it's just repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again. Billiards, another one, right? The ball's here, the ball's here, and the pocket's there. I'm doing the same thing every time. Rugby is not a simple domain. There are all kinds of moving parts, right? And I watch coaches put in these big elaborate plays, and I'm like, you realize all of this depends on 30 teenagers doing exactly what you expect them to do. Right? <laughs> Relying on teenagers to do anything is just the biggest crap shooting in the world. Rugby is a wicked domain. There are variations. We can have a wide out 20 meters out, 20 different times until a 20 different ways. That's just what it is, right? And your player's ability to adapt to these variables is basically what determines a big chunk of your success. Are they quick enough to pick up on what's going on? You're not always gonna be able to adapt all that in game on the sideline. They have to learn to diagnose on the field. And applying this to attack, especially more so with forwards than backs, is if you can turn your attack pattern into a wicked domain for the defense, then it's going to give you all sorts of advantages. And, you know, I, I like coaching backs, um, even though I played a lot and, and was not all that athletic. Uh, I, I pretend I am, I coach backs all the time. Uh, but forwards are really the key to unlocking this because backs generally are going to be marked. Um, they're going to have all kinds of different spots, and a lot of them kind of have these pretty notions. Forwards, on the other hand, are much more malleable than how they get used. Um, and they're generally more open, because you go tell a prop, hey, I want you to go up between the centers and run a hard line and crash through the back. He's going to hell yes, right? And he's gonna, they're going to eat that up. And so the more you can do that, the more you can turn your attack pattern into a wicked domain, and that's going to allow you to kind of take advantage of defenders. So when we talk about forward play to loose, right, old way, right? Smash and grab, right? A lot of pick and goes, one off crash balls, right? No offense, Wisconsin people, but like, your state loves this shit. Okay? <laughs> like, they eat it up. Um, when I coached the mid of the year of us, team, back down with uh, we went to Denver for the first time and went out west, right? It's SoCal, it's Texas, and it's NorCal, and uh, it's Utah, and all these teams, and we get there, and you're like, you know, all that smash ball stuff you do isn't gonna work out here. And I'm like, a lot of this smash ball shit, so we'll be fine. All right, but that's kind of the reputation just the Midwest in general has, right? We got big corn fed boys who run real hard, right? The problem is, if we're being honest, that is the simplest domain there is, right? I pick up ball, I run straight, I run into somebody. Unless you can just physically overwhelm the opposition, that's just not gonna work most of the time. Now it has a place, right? It's always nice to like, you know, let the big boy eat every once in a while and blow somebody up off a rock. But if it's what you're relying on to consistently set your attack, then other teams are going to figure it out. And eventually, you know, there, there's there's always a bigger, better dog out there somewhere, and you're going to run into them. And it's just not going to work as a reliable platform. So when we see a lot of teams set up, all right, and excuse the crudity of my drawing here, uh, this is how most teams will set up off a rock with their forms, right? So you'll have a rock, you'll have your nine. Teams defend it one, two, three, or whatever, post kill, or whatever you want to call it. And then everybody's in a triangle. How many teams use this triangle off of rucks? Pretty much everybody. All right, I do too sometimes. There's nothing wrong with it. But what are your options in this triangle coming off that rock? Who's the ball almost always going to go to? F1. F1, every time. That doesn't have to go to them. Or no. But the majority of the time, ball's coming to F1. F1's either crashing, sometimes it's a tip pass to F3, sometimes you get the real fancy guy who dummies out, dumps it back into F2 and things like that. But this is what most teams run, and not just in the Midwest, everywhere, right? Even a lot of international teams will run this. Uh, I run this too, right? You need it in there, it's a staple, 
it needs to be an available option. But if it's the only thing you're doing, then it goes from being, it's not necessarily in our, our wicked domain category, right? Now it's in our simple domain category. Because if all they're doing is showing the defense the same thing every single time, what's eventually going to happen? You gotta figure it out, right? Especially if, oh shit, they do the same thing every other team does. They're going to figure it out. And when defense gets comfortable, they're putting pressure up faster, right? As soon as that falls out, what are these three defenders doing in this situation? They're coming up, right? That defender in the middle is coming straight to F1. The defender on the inside is holding until he sees both hands out, and then he's crashing in. And the defender at three's got F3, and as soon as the ball goes wide, first set of hands. It's what everybody does. It's what everybody's comfortable with. They don't even have to think, right? You see a lot of, it's just reactionary, right? Uh, two hard steps, right? That's what, that's what we do a lot of, right? Ball comes out, two hard steps. Everybody can do that because they've already diagnosed what you're going to do before you even do it. So everybody knows how to defend it. Everybody knows how to defend it. Everybody's seen it. And while it can be useful and effective, you kind of have to have other options. And so that kind of brings me to um, kind of the more philosophical thing. Um, how we define a forward in the old way versus the new way. Um, we look at forwards as you know the guys who get some tough yards, the guys who come in, in tight. Um, but if you look, especially at the international level in the modern day game, Forwards are much more personal than history. I hate positions. I hate them. Uh, I believe in number nines, because nines are just different, right? Anybody in here is a nine, you know exactly what I mean, right? But as soon as you call a guy prop, he starts thinking, why do you do prop things? Like, what are prop things? I don't know. But it just gets in their head. Oh, blocks do this. Oh, I'm the flanker, I need to do this. No, I'm a center, I do this. I'm a wing, wings don't rock. Like, get out of here, right? The modern day game doesn't work that. It requires everyone to do everything. Everybody's got a hand. Everybody's got a pass. Everybody's got a run. Everybody's got to do their If you want to play at the highest level and maximize your team's ability, you have to be able to do all these different things from all 15 positions. And while fours may not be as athletic out wide as your wings, they still need to be effective and useful out wide. And no, I'm not saying like, hey, your 280 pound props got to be able to get 60 meter breakaways out wide in the five meter channel. That's ridiculous. But he can't be useless out there, right? He's got to be able to do something while he's out there and, and contribute. And so this kind of requires uh, rethinking of the way we use forwards in rugby. Uh, and there's kind of three basic tenets the teams I coach fall, right? So how can we make our attack pattern uh, into the wicked domain category? One, give your forwards more options. A, they're going to like it. Right? Because now they can pass again. Nothing makes my skin crawl more when I get forwards into our HP program. I'm like, well, my high school coach said forwards don't pass. Get the fuck out of here. Right? Like, everybody can pass. Two, very where you use them. They don't always have to set up off a rock, so we'll get to that. And three, patterns, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, don't, don't stay married to your pattern. Be, be adaptable and teach them to be adaptable. So let's get to this first one. You need to give your forwards options. So I, I included lots of pictures. Uh, if your favorite team is not in here, I apologize. Um, I, I stole a lot of pictures and little video clips from teams that I think do this the best. So, um, whatever. So let's look at this setup. It's essentially your same personnel that you would have had in your, your triangle or your sphere or whatever. But this time you notice all three forwards are stacked. F1, F2, F3 behind them. So how do you defend this? Who goes, all right, who's taking F1? The middle defender's only taking F1. Who's got F2? <laughs> can they make that decision before the ball is out? No, no. No. Now, when we're in our triangle, can they make that decision before the ball is out? <coughs> yes. Yeah, right? Because that inside guy's probably not looping all the way around, and if he does, by the time he gets it done, we got the defense covered, right? We can scramble. What can we do with attack? Where can F2 and F3 go? In either direction. They, flood space. they can both flood a space. They can both flood inside. One can go right, one can go left. One can go there. You, can, you can crisscross. What could you also do with F1 if you didn't want him to get the ball? He can run on a dummy line. Right? And now you got F2 
right? Or you can even break all three out, as we're going to see in a second, so that all three are running without the ball in line, and then nine just picks who he wants to give the ball to. The point is, A, we're giving everybody options here, and B, because the defense doesn't know, we haven't telegraphed anything, the defense doesn't know where we're going. So they can't just shoot up with those two hard steps when the ball's out, because if they come this way and we just send everybody out wide, well, that, that inside defender's useless, right? We've essentially turned this from a three on three into a three on two just by changing the way we align, because now our guys know, hey, let's just, you know, we'll flood this, right? And we'll keep flooding it until they move guys out. And then as soon as they move guys out, what do they do? Right back inside, right? We're going to move the attack to where the defenders are. You guys know Yogi Berra? Yankee great, right? Hit it where they ain't. Just gonna run it where they ain't, right? Because now we have the options to go where we want to go. So let's look at this in practice. All right? So if you see, this is Exeter. They do this the most, I would say. You have three guys here in a stack. You see the two with the circles, and yes, 12 is the back. But you have three guys stacked right there off of the rock. And then all they're going to do is run one guy through on a dummy line, give the ball to the second guy, and now he's got the third guy on the stack coming behind him, another player outside, and they're going to even sneak the weak side wing to either come around or come back inside. The point being, all of this creates options for everybody. Because when that guy runs that, that front guy runs that hard dummy line, that middle defender's taking him, and now we've just turned the outside defender, that third guy, into one man defending four. Okay. And if they bite down on everything, he can just send the ball out the back door wide. The idea being, we're going to show like we're crashing it in, but the ball is actually going to be wide. Now, if this front guy, if the gap is there, what can nine do? Let's say they don't have that first pillar defender. What can they do? Yeah, they just give him the ball. Right? It doesn't have to be a double line. Um, so we use this at IU. Guy. If he wants the ball, he doesn't say anything. If he sees there's a defender there, he calls smoke. So if the nine hears smoke, he knows it's going out the back to the guy behind. If the nine doesn't hear anything, the ball goes to him. So now he's assuming I'm going to give the ball to this guy on a hard line because it's the best option, it's the easiest option, the most complicated option. But as soon as he hears smoke, he's letting that guy run through and hit the second guy out the back. Right? The idea being, we can immediately adapt. And the guy making the decision is the guy running right at the gap who's going to see whether the defender's there. Right? So it's a very simple formula that allows us to get options, and we're, we're reducing the amount of people who have to make decisions. Right? We're, we're getting rid of those variables, but in creating more options, we're making it more liquid. So let's see it in action. So we have the same thing off a of ruck. Right? We got three guys here who are stacked off the ruck. And as we run it, all, right, all he does is hit the outside option. Okay. So, ball comes to the second guy, he is the third guy out wide. Now, yes, he got tackled the game line, but if you're breaking game line with your forwards consistently, that's success, right? This isn't going to lead to a try every time. Uh, if I knew a playoff of Rucks that led to a try every time, I would not be in 83 Oshkosh, Wisconsin right now. I would be on the beach with all the money the Tier 1 countries paid me to give this speech, right? There is no magic bullet, but what we're looking is something that just continue to wear down the defense, and that's essentially the option we're creating here. Right? Looking at it again, same thing, except now the guy comes back inside. Right? Why? Because we have the option. That guy's stacked behind, you come out. That guy's stacked behind, you come in. The option is not there in the triangle, it's there in the stack. Does that make sense? So kind of to recap, right? We have all kinds of options here. We have dummy lines. We can go to the second guy. We can go to the first guy. The third guy can go in, the third guy can go out. Both guys can basically do all, right? The biggest advantage being the defense doesn't know what's coming at it. So what do they have to do? Are they flying up when the ball's out? No. They have to sit and they have to wait. And even if you're just getting a half second, that could be the difference between that third guy hitting the gap or not hitting the gap. Right? Uh, those half seconds matter, especially as you move up. All right, so the second thing we can do is vary where and how we use these defenders. All right, so I'm big on 
Your forwards don't have to take the ball right off the rug. You can have a first receiver here who basically serves as a middleman. And it could be a forward, it could be a back. I'll bring my weak side wing into this. He'll basically stand where the forward would usually be, catch, and just deliver it. So our stack isn't coming right off the rug. Our stack is coming wider out. And what's the advantage of moving everything wider from the rug? What do the defenders have to do? Yeah, they have to move wider, they have to defend more space, and all of a sudden those gaps between them are now larger, giving us larger running line, uh, running lanes. All right, so if you move your stack wider, it's gonna give your forwards more options and more space to operate, right? And we've essentially taken this guy and rendered him useless. Because there's almost no way, if we execute this correctly, that he's getting out there to help on that pop. And so you're putting yourself in a situation where instead of attacking this defender, where he has help on both sides, now we're attacking this defender, right? And yes, there's probably like a 10 outside of him, but that 10 doesn't want to mess with those folks, right? And if he does, that's fine, because if he bites down and we wreck over and we send the ball to our 10, we now have a numbers advantage, right? So you can insert these stacks anywhere. You can even insert them between the centers. Uh, when we're in loose play a lot, I'll have my guys, like they look to stack up in the middle of the field, and they'll stack up off the centers and run lines off the centers. So we'll see this here in a second. So we have Ted here, who's gonna be the first receiver, and you see three guys stacked behind him. And if we look at it from behind, this is essentially what the defense is seeing. They're targeting that guy right in front of two. What's he have to do? Can he move around, or does he have to commit to the ball carrier? Yeah, he's, he's gotta to commit to that guy. And so, He's gonna to commit to two, and the guy they're ultimately gonna target is the guy in the circle here. 12 and 13 break off. 13, or this guy commits to 12, 13 takes the inside line, and he's through for a try, right? The idea being, they're gonna break off, two commits, we get a two on one, two makes the right decision, and we're through the gap. He's gonna make the right decision every time, of course not, but options, right? So we see it again. We have a first receiver. We have three guys in a stack, okay? The ball's gonna come out, and he just hits the big man on a crash, okay? It's simple, it's easy, it's a quick reset, and the big thing is here, as long as this guy does his work on the ground and gets the ball back, we can go quick and immediately recycle to our next space, right? Same idea. Ruck, first receiver, three guys in a stack, uh, the ball comes out, and this time the third guy's just going through the back door. Right? So it didn't go to the front guy on the crash like it did, because it, think about it, if all the defense sees is first receiver, big guy up front crash, first receiver, big guy up front crash, first receiver, big guy up front crash, eventually you're gonna set it up for that guy to come through on a dummy line, you throw it in behind, and all of a sudden the second or third guy in the stack is through for a, for a try. Right? It also helps you a guy run a nice hard line outside. Of course, the Irons have a false try, but whatever. All right. Again, first receiver, three in the stack. All right, we come out to this rack. This time we're going to bring it back inside. Same idea. All right. You've attacked wide so many times, the defense is just going to have it in their head. They have to move their defenders out there to cover that outside lane, and it's going to open everything back up for He's not even in the stack, it's just a guy running a nice inside line, and he's through. So, your four cross balls don't have to come off that rock. You can move them off that defender, move them wider, and it'll also help you, like, I, my teams, I play five by five, so one five in the line, the other five in the line. By moving your forwards wider, it makes it much easier to move that ball across the field with more efficiency, because now you're not necessarily asking big guys to pass under pressure, you're just asking them to run hard lines off somebody else under pressure, which is quite what they want to do. All right, the third big thing for me, uh, don't be married to a pattern. So there's all kinds of stuff, right? One, three, three, one, two, four, two, 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 right? Uh, I had a new coach ran at three, three, three. Don't ask me how the hell that works. Uh, he wasn't a coach for very long. That's probably why. Uh, how many of you guys run something like this with your clubs? Right? Why? Why do you run it? What? It's easy. Clarity for clarity. Clarity, clarity for what? Where they, where, 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 where you think they should be? Do you tailor it where you know 
One, two, five are here. Six, seven, three are here. Or is it just caught up? Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else got any other reasons to run it? A way to get organized. So I guess my question, so I used to be very anti these things. And the big reason for me is a lot of the stuff you say makes sense in theory, but I have coaches tell me, well, I watch Australia. They run a one three three one. Well, why does Australia run a one three three one? Well, it's not just that they're, yes, as professionals, that's half of it, but also, like, they keep their hooker in the wide chair, channel. Their hooker is one of the most skilled players. He's basically a back who's just got a back, right? And so they can put him out there because he can do all the things a center can do. Most of you guys don't have hookers who have backline, elite backline skills. So if he's just out there getting lost, really, he's their hooker out there. That doesn't really make sense. Now, I've softened on this quite a bit as a coach for him, um, and I do think there's a place for it, but if you're only using it so that guys know where to go, you're not necessarily getting all the benefit out of it, right? Yes, it's important to have a, uh, some kind of structure and to set things up, but you kind of have to put little, we'll say carrots in there to incentivize guys to look outside the structure when it's there. So if you have flexibility to your pattern, rather than it being a rigid structure, it becomes a tool to kind of implement whatever your, your strategy is going to be. And it's not big on tactics and strategy, it's, it's the whole thing, right? But figure out what your tactics are for your strategy, and then use your, whatever your formation is, your pattern is, to achieve those goals. Uh, so uh, a few things that I like to do. Uh, one, you have to deploy your backs to work around this pattern. And what I mean by that? I the team that does this the best in the world is the Crusaders. Now it helps that they have maybe the best tent on the planet, uh, and my favorite center, even though nobody would agree with me, right? Uh, but if you ever watch the Crusaders play, they have Richie Moonga and Jack Goodhue, and they are basically Swiss Army knives who just float in and out from between the pots. And they are far more distributors. Jack Goodhue is not a crasher. And, and yes, he's got packs we all last, but like he is not the best center in New Zealand, but he's the best center at executing what the Crusaders want to do, and it's insanely effective because they basically use these guys as links between their four pods. Okay? So if we look at it here, we have a four pod set up, and they're just running everything off 10. Conversely, they'll have good you out here in this glorious mullet, right? And they'll run fours off those guys. And those guys' job is essentially to set up the other players. And so they're the operators, for lack of a better word. Um, there's no that, hey, 10 is always here as first receiver, 12 is always here as second. They basically have the freedom to go. Um, I call them sharks on my team, right? Sharks never stop swimming, they're always out hunting, right? I always have two backs who are just out hunting, right? Hey, I see a pot over here, I'm gonna link up with them, I'm gonna get the ball in the right spot. That's it, right? I like making it about 13, 15, some people like making it 10, 12, it doesn't really matter. It's more based on what your personnel fits, but, but pick your guys. And as your players are stationed around the field with their pods, these guys have to be able to float between them and use them. And if you see, hey, there's a ton of space over here, and I know you guys are here, move that way, right? And I'll get you into that gap. And so their job is to set those pods up for success, right? They also will use those pods as dummy runners, and they become the de facto decision makers, so that they'll run those guys through, and you know, they got Lavelli and all these other guys out wide who, We've crashed, we've crashed, we've crashed. Oh, these guys are coming through, balls in behind. All of a sudden, one of our dynamic guys out wide has the ball in hand. And so, essentially, what you have is two creators floating across the field. Pods of four is created, uh, floating across the field. And then you're big, you know, you're not moving everything around. And then you have four other backs who are just looking for lines to run off those points. And it layers their attack. Right? So they're using those stacks, they're using those pods to create layers, and then they have these two guys who basically run the show. And so if you can get your pattern to not just be, all right, these three guys take a crash ball, and these three guys take a crash ball, and the ball goes wide to the wing, and there's a forward out there to be the runner, right? That's a very simplistic one, three, three, one, but it's not maximizing what you're getting and using it. And we'll kind of get to the wing in a second here. Uh, the second point, right? 
you don't have to get into your pattern straight away. Right? This is a big thing I see. I, I worked with Sully Thompson at high school in America for years. And there would be a line out, and he'd be one like, come on, we gotta get our pot out here. I'm like, no, you don't. What's the rush? Right? There's nobody running a stopwatch. I'm like, oh shit, man, you didn't make it there in 10 seconds with cutting from the team. Right? Like, get into your pattern in a natural manner. And it might take three to four phases, but it's going to allow you to kind of take advantage of any things that you see with the defense. So this is Ireland, and I couldn't get all the pictures, but Ireland had a line out here. They took a crash ball in. All right, we had a tackle here. They ran another crash ball off of this. All right, then they took a third crash ball with their forwards, and all of a sudden, three of the forwards just kind of leaped back when they realized Japan had overcommitted to this side. Right? I see a lot of, hey, like, we leave, you know, we run a 2 4 2 and the prop of the hooker stay in this channel. So the line out ends, and the prop of the hooker just stand there. Like, all right, mine, right? And, and they're just, they're waiting, oh, the ball come back, right? And, oh, wait here, the ball come back, right? No, right? You don't have to go there immediately. You can get active. And so all eight guys, right, all eight forwards, ran multiple phases, worked their way into their pattern, and they took advantage of what opened up because Japan overcommitted on the fence. Right? So don't think, hey, I gotta get to my area. Think, scan the field, here's our opportunities. And if they're not there, that's fine. We'll run three or four phases, we'll play a possession game, and then we'll get into our pattern naturally. Because if you get into your pattern naturally, you're not leaving chances on the field. Right? It's that stat I mentioned earlier, 17 tries. You have, if there is an opportunity for a try in a big game, you, 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 you've gotta shoot for it. And if you, don't take those shots because you're not in a position to take them. You're leaving an opportunity for points on the board. Good defenses, it is hard to get tries. You have to maximize your opportunities and look for them where you can. Third one, uh, don't be afraid to break your pattern. Uh, I use pour, some teams use flood, something like that. Uh, if it's there, it's there. But there might be a thing. If we commit six bodies to this weak side, it's there. Guys shouldn't say, well, well but I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle. Well, there's 20 meters of space and one guy defended me. Why didn't we go there? So don't marry them to the pattern to the point that they think, I have to stay here. If your guy sees something, he's got to be able to marshal those troops and get them where they need to go. Conversely, forwards need to get it out of their head that they're just out there to crash. Right? This is Greg Holmes, number three for Australia. He's really good. He's the first receiver. I know a lot of high school coaches that said, hey, your prop's going to line up the first receiver, then shit break. You've got to trust those guys to make those decisions. And it's got to be something you implement from day one. Everybody can do this job. My team played, when I was coaching out here this fall, we played Michigan State. I think I told the story last night, so sorry if you're already right? The best kick we had in that entire game, our loose head prop, who was U20, 6'3", 280, big boy, awesome player, was that first receiver, caught the ball, got ran through, it wasn't there, and he put a kick to the corner, got landed in bounds, about five years from the sideline, rolled out right at five feet one. Right? And now all of a sudden, yeah, it's their ball, they're 95 meters away, we were able to put pressure on. We didn't get hurt, but you get the point. That's an excellent play, and an excellent outcome, and most teams would never let their number three line up at first receiver and boot the ball down the corner. You have to give them that flexibility, though. Now, I'm not saying I'll let everybody kick. God knows that'll turn into a shit show. <laughs> a terrible ice cream game. But if it's there, they need to know it's an option. Right? Make them aware. They shouldn't be the first thing they look for, but they also shouldn't feel like they're not allowed to do it. Give them kind of the freedom and let them impress you, for lack of a better word. Right? Now, they might just be getting ready to take a crash ball, but you never know what's going to come from. Um, if it's there, you gotta take the opportunity. The fourth one, be careful the verbiage you use in terms of implementing your pattern. If you sell it as, this is a structure so you know where to go, but they're gonna implement it as a plan for where to go. When what it really is, at least for the better teams is, 
it's their way of maximizing the width of the field. The biggest advantage attack has is there's all this space, and it's really hard to cover. Tries get harder to come by as you get closer to the try zone because there's less space to defend. And so defense gets easier. You guys come up, right? You don't have to keep wings back. Now all of a sudden, instead of playing 15 on 12, you're playing 15 on 14. It's a different game. And so if you introduce your pattern as essentially a way to use width, then that's what they're going to, that's the first word that's going to pop into their head. And they're not going to look at it as, I need to be here. They're going to look at it as, this is a tool for us to move the ball to this area of the field and take advantage of it. You know, words matter, right? So if you look at the Crusaders again, they have seven and eight here on the five meter line. Right? There are four guys in the middle, five, one, three, and four are all in the middle of the for phase. They have six and two all the way across. They run something coming off, first receiver, three, four top of them. They're not a stack, which would just make the most beautiful picture in the world to me, but whatever. And then by the next phase, they're ready to go get two backs and two forwards. The point is, they hold their width. And so if you're selling this as, it's not our structure, it's our tool to take advantage of the width of the field, that it puts it in players' heads that this isn't this rock solid, I do this every time, right? There's a lot of that football mentality. You guys are coach boys, I'm sure you understand it. Right? You're like, give me the play to run, right? No, that's not what we do here, right? We're out here looking for options and variables and all these different moving parts. But with this, your big advantage, and if you if you set this up to take advantage of your width as opposed to take advantage of a set structure, then players are going to approach it differently and they're going to be more willing to use it in that manner, which is ultimately what you want to do. And I know a lot of you said, well, players need to know where to go. Yes, you're still telling players where to go, but that's not the selling point here, and that's not the focal point. The focal point is taking advantage of, of the width. So, kind of in summary, use your force to make your attack pattern a wicked domain. Right, going back to that sociology lesson. Put variables for the defense to consider, because then it's going to make their job a lot harder. Right? Line your forwards up in ways that maximizes opportunities. It's all about options. Give them options, 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 options. And you guys know who Anatoly Tarasov is? Probably not. You guys know the old Russian hockey team? The one we beat in the 1980s in America is amazing. Right? Uh, he was that coach. And he was very innovative in that everybody else kind of played big, old hockey, right? You could be crushed guys and you could be slow. His was more hey, everything's going to be fast, the ball's going to move, and we're going to have options. And he wrote a book, and I've been trying to find it for like five years, but apparently it's only copy of the book or a bunch of so you can really find excerpts. But he talks about how by, by essentially creating as many options as you can, is you force the defenders to prepare for everything. And that's what you're attached to do. Because as soon as you put a little bit of doubt in the defender's mind, their entire advantage is gone. And if they don't think they know what's coming, that confidence drains quickly, even in professionals. And so the options put that doubt in there. Very where they're deployed, and, and again, with the patterns, uh, use them. They're great. But maximize what you're getting at. Don't sell it as a structure. Sell it as a way to use width and to attack. Give your team options so that you're tying it into whatever tactics your team um, is trying to get. Uh, by the way, my email's there at the bottom. If you would like a copy of this PowerPoint, shoot me an email. I would be happy to share it with you. Uh, are there any questions? I try to get out of here as I am early. I know everybody wants lunch. Are there any questions about any of this? Yeah. So when you use your stats, do you have specific areas of the field that you say, you know, for this area, I want my stat here? So I'm anti hard and fast rules. Obviously, yeah. Because, like. But it's like more options. Like, yeah, it's all about options. So we'll use stats straight up off a rock. So say we're buried and we're 20 meters out. We're going to run a stack, but we're probably going to be smart about it. Give it to the guy up front, crash it in, <laughs> set it up, build a wall, get it front down. Um, if we're in the middle of the field, and it's coming, you know, it's, let's say we're stacked between 12 and 13, a lot of times what we'll do is uh, we'll give the ball to a first receiver, and rather than giving the ball to the front of the stack and running off him, we'll have those three guys all run lines off the first receiver, giving him one, two, three options, and then usually a fullback coming in behind out the back, so we actually create four options. Because everybody's looking at the stack. What they're not looking at is like, you know, maybe the weak side wing sneaking over and coming in. 
Uh, I found my way to think across the like, goalpost at any point, and we'll never play with it again. I don't need to play right? uh, Guys who use wings the old school way, we just like, I'm a hand. They can run fast down the side like that. That doesn't work anymore. Uh, my wings are, they're sharks. They're everywhere. Right? They're constantly in search. Uh, my back line's all kinds of fucked up uh, because I just like it that way. Uh, but like, their numbers other than that are basically useless. We're just constantly changing the rules. Because again, A, it's the options, but B, if you keep mixing up what the defense sees, it's going to be harder for them. A, to prepare during the week, uh, especially like D1A, they see all your film, they know what you do. So the more stuff you put on film, the more they have to prepare for. Uh, but B, in game, the less tendencies you have, the harder you're just going to be prepared for. And so it takes buy in from the players. Because a lot of them like it, right? A lot of them are very comfortable with like, no, I like playing 12, and I run my crash lines, sometimes you give me the ball, sometimes I don't. Don't make me go beat the fence and like have three fours there. That's just how they feel. Now, I tell guys like that, like, go get a smaller number on the back. Uh, but, you know, it, it takes buying and it takes establishing that kind of tone like, right from the outset. Like, no, this is how we're going to play. The ball's going to move this way. And once you establish it, it actually, it's almost infectious in that guys just start looking for lines to run because it's fun to play that way, right? Like, especially if you're a forward, uh, it's like, oh, hell yeah, I'll be like, out here and run up the and stuff like that. Uh, so, any other questions? No? I'll take it that as uh, I did an awesome job and you understand everything, and that's why there's no questions, and I'm amazing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if you have questions, uh, I'll be here the rest of the day. Um, me, like I said, shoot me an email if you want to copy this PowerPoint. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.